A warm welcome to our history show here on Uxbridge FM. And I'm very pleased to welcome Ken Pierce back. And he's got some more short stories about Uxbridge. And the first one we're going to cover today is Treaty House Part 2. For those of you who listened before, we had Part 1. And we're dying to hear about what happened with the wooden panelling in the uh, in the treaty house so uh, good morning ken good morning everybody <laughs> <laughs> and when you're ready tell us all about the treaty house yes thank you well in my first talk i explained that the crown and treaty public house is all that remains of a, a large mansion called the place erected in the 1530s by a prominent lawyer named dr thomas hughes it was by far the largest house in Uxbridge. In 1645, talks were held there in an attempt to bring the Civil War to a close. But although the two sides met and talked for three weeks, no agreement was reached and no treaty was signed. And then about 1790, the new Grand Junction Canal was cut through the estate and it was really no longer a desirable place to live. About two-thirds of the house were demolished, including the large room where the treaty negotiations were held. The remaining wing of the building became a public house, alterations being carried out under the direction of the architect John Soane. Now, let's take the story further today. Of all the people who visited the treaty house in the 19th century, the most interesting was probably Joseph Bonaparte, the former King of Spain. His famous brother, Napoleon Bonaparte, before his downfall, controlled much of southwest Europe, including Spain. And so in 1808, he appointed his Joseph, his older brother, to become king. Unfortunately, Joseph was unpopular with the Spanish people. And indeed, um, he, he didn't really want the job, actually. So in 1813, after only five years, he abdicated and left the country. He adopted a subsidiary title and was from then known as the Count of Sevillier and took his family off to America, where they stayed for 15 years. They then returned to Europe and came to this country. And here he agreed to rent Denham Place in Denham from a family called Way, W-A-Y. On the 4th of August, 1834, the Observer newspaper reported, the Count of Sevillier, formerly King of Spain, and his family and suite are staying at the Crown Inn for a few days until repairs at Denham Place are completed. We know now that his stay in this country was brief and his, he and his family soon moved to Italy and the Count died in Florence in 1844. But undoubtedly the ex-King of Spain was the most notable person to stay at the Crown Inn in the 19th century. In 1920, early 1920, a hundred years ago exactly, rumours began to circulate that the wooden panelling, a fine example of its kind, was being sold to an American. It was in a room on the first floor of the inn. The landlord immediately made it clear that he was not involved. It was the owners, Weathered's the Brewers, who were involved. The headline in the local paper was, Uxbridge must protest. Uxbridge Council indeed wanted to keep the panelling, of course, and, and so did many others here, but there was just no legislation or controls at that time that could prevent the sale. And so the transaction went ahead. The purchaser, Louis L. Allen, had the panelling put on the line of Berengaria which sailed for New York. Again, the local paper. 
Nothing can replace a room of such historic and unique interest, and that is now lost forever. In a reconstructed room, the wooden panelling was displayed in the Louis Allen Galleries in Madison Square, New York. But there's a tr surprising twist to this story. After World War II, the panelling passed into the ownership of Armand Hammer, the oil magnate and philanthropist, and he decided to present it to our Queen as a coronation gift. This story, by the way, is told in the book Hammer, Witness to History, a book written by Hammer and Neil Lydon in 1987. So the panelling crossed the Atlantic again and at the Queen's request was replaced in its former and original home. On hearing that the installation had taken place, the Queen, via her private secretary, sent a telegram to the inn which reads, The Queen sincerely thanks you and the directors of Strong and Weathered for your kind and loyal message. Her Majesty is delighted to hear that the restoration of the original panelling has taken place. It has given her much pleasure. Until the recent restoration of the building, that telegram was framed and on the wall of a ground floor room. I haven't been able to get in since the, since the inn reopened, but I sincerely hope that the telegram is still there. I'm sure someone, someone will let us know. <laughs> That's great. Thanks, Ken. And if anybody knows where the telegram is, where it's displayed, then, yeah, as Ken says, do let us know. That's great. 